psychoanalysis and art in this series. We will take up two instrumental, not instrumental, one instrumental composition and one Raga composition. We have selected one composition by Mozart representing the Western classical and one composition by Kumar Gandharva representing the Eastern classical, the Indian classical to be more precise. We will try to approach these two compositions from what they release inside of us from a psychoanalytic standpoint. We have discussed before that psychoanalysis has two applications, broad category applications a clinical application and a non-clinical application. Clinical application is for therapy, psychological testing. Non-clinical application of psychoanalysis includes application to art, literature, films, music, application to all social sciences, history, management, One important objective of today's discussion is not only to open up the area of psychoanalysis and art and venture into music, but more importantly, start building capacity for application of psychoanalysis to the non-verbal. Psychoanalysis essentially is a verbal enterprise. Occasionally, we do deal with images of dreams, slips of hearing, slips in painting, slips in behavior, but they constitute a minor part of the whole area of psychoanalysis. Predominantly, it is a verbal enterprise. Our training also is essentially driven by the verbal enterprise. Psychoanalysis recently has opened up in a more engaging way, something which was distantly talked about before, and that is the non-verbal. Non-verbal has its significance in all schools. One way to divide the enterprise of psychoanalysis is to divide it into the verbal and the non-verbal, which has not been often taken recourse to this categorization, but it's a very fruitful categorization, very profitable. The non-verbal constitutes of many groups of entities. One group is non-verbal communication. That's one category that constitutes, rather one subcategory that constitutes the category of the non-verbal. So there's non-verbal communication. Then there is a pre-linguistic area. 
before child enters into language. And then even after language takes root, what is yet to be processed in language, something which is semi-processed that beyond engages with. And the pre-linguistic real that Laka engages with. As someone who wishes to apply psychoanalysis for one's own development and use psychoanalysis for healing and development of others, building capacity in the area of the non-verbal is a very essential part of capacity building of one's own. One entertaining and interesting way to do it is to use music and songs which are not making use of known language. We can use instrumental music or we can use the raga music which makes use of sound, human sound, but not words of or language. So today we will develop capacity in that area by taking two examples one from Western classical, one from Indian classical. And in neither of these two compositions, we see use of language. So we'll be dealing with the non-verbal. So let's go into it. Let's survey briefly before we go into the real discussion the arena of the non-verbal. There is a pre-language unconscious which constitutes both of the Lacanian real and the Lacanian imaginary. One important element often in therapy is giving words to feelings which are in search of words affect in search of language. And often naming helps in healing. Not necessarily it helps the whole problem to be healed, but it does bring about one incremental step in healing. It also makes finite the anticipation of the anticipatory anxiety of the infinite into a more controllable finite domain. Wilfred Bjorn looked at psychic crisis, especially the type of crisis he was dealing with, very deep crisis of psychosis and schizophrenia or deeply rooted cognitive disorders. Those type of crises, beyond looked at those psychic crises as essentially an epistemological crisis. And he looked at psychosis essentially as a thought crisis, very different from the group which looks at psychic crisis essentially as a crisis of blocked up effect. And Beyond's way of looking at it was a very different way. One of the reasons was the group he was dealing with is very difficult group and very less congruent to intensive techniques of effect exploration. Bjorn often used to say that there are effects, especially those related to anxiety or something near to that, that have lost the cognitive component 
to which they were once attached and therefore you feel the nameless dread. There is the effect moving around, but the effect has lost the cognitive address of the event to which it was once attached. And this gives rise to the nameless dread. The dread which we cannot make out is because of what? It is a dread that has broken free from its source. When Freud says, where it is, their ego shall be. This covers many situations and one of the situations is cover, it covers is where a fact has lost or is divorced or cut off from the cognitive component and it is the cognitive component which has to be brought in the language which has to be brought in, the naming which has to be brought in, the verbal that has to be brought in to really connect with the effect and with that connect, pull the effect up into the consciousness, which is a very different way of dealing with the effect compared to ISTDP or other effect release techniques which try to block thoughts and put pressure for effect to come up. We therefore also look at the psychic crisis differently. There is one way of looking at it essentially as a cognitive crisis. Second way of looking at it essentially as an effect crisis. And we can look at a pre-language effect and a post-language effect. The <clears throat> pre-language natural one non-verbal and a post-language non-verbal. So the non-verbal non does not cease with the advent of language even after language arri arrives and settles itself. The non-verbal still exists. And when we talk of the unconscious fantasy, some component of unconscious fantasy is non-verbal. And then there is an even more interesting and more esoteric state of pre-unconscious fantasy. What Beyond would call the beta stage, the beta elements. One way to understand it in more elemental terms is to go for a more elemental model of the mind. One elemental model of the mind that I have developed is heat. So heat is one model of the mind. And <clears throat> the bomb is model of the mind. And heat is holistic elemental analysis and therapy the model that I have developed. This is one model of mind which can be used to understand these different entities. And today we will use instrumental music and raga music <clears throat> to develop our psychoanalytic capacity to deal with the non-verbal. I have two short recordings here. You can I have two short recordings here which I will play. I cannot play the whole composition. I'll just play a small part of it. 
it's available on YouTube. You can hear the whole composition. But I have taken up a small part where we don't have language, so we can deal strictly with the non-verbal. The first composition is by Mozart. I have taken a small part of that composition, second movement. It's a flute and harp concerto K229. Many have played it. Many recordings are available on YouTube. I have selected one. I have given credits to. And from that, I have selected a very small part for our discussion, academic discussion. Similarly, uh, Pandit Kumar Gandharva, one of the masters of Indian classical music, late Kumar Gandharva, I should say. He has composed and sung on Ram Malwati and a small, a small part of that I have taken up for our discussion, academic discussion. So I'll play these two compositions and then we'll go into a discussion.
Can you now play a composition by Pandit, late Pandit Kumar Gandharva? Small part of Raag Balavati. Please go to the originals on YouTube if recording is not clear. Let us now go into what this non-verbal release is in us and to far, what extent, how far can we express it, understand it, use it from a psychoanalytic standpoint. Psychoanalysis was not created essentially for non-clinical application. It is a stretch of application. We therefore will have to also bring in concepts from the broad area of spirituality and psychology into psychoanalysis to power this enterprise. Let us survey some of the concepts before we go into the analysis of the two compositions. Some concepts we we'll require in that analysis. First concept we bring is the concept of the zones of the mind. Sri Aurobindo talks about the zones of the mind in his language, the planes and parts of consciousness. Psychoanalysis also talks about the zones of the mind, but it is an oversimplified version. So we talk of the conscious, the pre-conscious and the unconscious. But we don't go into the subcategorization further of the unconscious, subcategorization of the conscious or the subcategorization of the superconscious, which we generally don't go into. So we just keep three categories, the conscious, the pre-conscious, the unconscious. We don't go into further subcategorization. We also don't go into the further reaches of human nature as Maslow would call it, the higher states of mind. So we have to bring in the concept of the zones of mind.
Sherbindo's model will be very useful. There is a Buddhist model also that divides entire range of consciousness into 14 zones. That also is very useful. Today we are beginning the exploration, so we won't go into the details, but we will suffice it with saying that we can divide from our standpoint of analysis today, all the zones of the mind into two, an everyday state of the mind or states of the mind, let me say everyday zone of the mind, and the state that music creates or the zone into which music takes us. So there is an everyday state and the state music creates. There is an everyday zone and the zone music takes us into. Obviously the two are different. You are sitting and you are in a particular zone. You are working, you are in a particular zone. And then you put on music and you are completely in a different zone. The zones of mind are very necessary because in both these compositions we see that if we divide the compositions into small bits, we see on some occasions the composer touches the heights and some parts of the composition come from great heights, other parts of the composition come from slightly lesser heights. Of course, it's all above the ordinary but relatively speaking. The entire composition does not flow from one height. The highest the composition reaches is somewhere here and then the lowest is here and in between are all the fluctuations. It is when the heights are touched, the highest is touched, that we really feel it is out of this world and it gives us a different type of joy, different type of happiness. Both these compositions take us from ordinary banal state of every day into the surreal zone. And in that surreal zone, as the composer or the performer, breaks from his everyday consciousness, he is able to touch the heights. And in a way, a surreal act, a surreal play is reenacted. And that is true of all songs. All songs reenact or enact some surreal play. One way to understand it is to use the Indian yogic psychophilosophy and talk of five zones of reality. The physical zone of matter, energy and force, space and time, the astral zone, the zone of effect, the zone of thoughts, the zone of karma and the zone of bliss. The two compositions we see from that model of the mind essentially take us into the astral world. And one of the ideas there, not the only idea, but one of the idea is that in the astral world, there is a zone, an eternal platonic world of the highest of music. And it is only some part of it we are able to bring down into our human world. And it is in that zone, in the astral world, that we really have the music of the spheres and really those spheres of music. Are we talking of reality and science of future or are we talking about imagination? 
is a question for future. What the two compositions also touch upon often are feelings which are indescribable, undescribable. Felix without words, Felix beyond words, Felix before words. And it can also release into us unconsciously thoughts without words, pre linguistic thinking. And this pre linguistic thinking. is of two different flavors. Evaluate your thought, which works even in pre-linguistic state, where evaluation has to be done of the stimulus to find out how much effect should be generated. It's a evaluative thought. And then there are imaginative thoughts, which are like, counterparts of our conscious thoughts, but in the unconscious, in a pre-linguistic state. It's not easy to understand these concepts, even more difficult to get in touch with, very difficult to get in touch with, very rare people would have got in touch with it. One more element of the two compositions we realize are they are healing to us. Not only they are enjoyable, they are also healing, they are also cathartic. It is also a, a journey of experience. They are health giving and quality of life enhancing. And this brings out the whole aspect of music for healing. Uh, as an everyday part of a healthy lifestyle where 20 minutes of music in the morning and in the evening is a great de-stressor, healer, happiness giver and a very good part of the preventive basket. If we create an everyday preventive basket for good health, Music is a very important component of that preventive basket. Let us now go into the two compositions. In Mozart's composition, we start with the orchestra. And the first thing that music does, the music played by the orchestra, is it helps us collect our consciousness which is spread and scattered around, collects it. And once it is collected, there is a downward cathartic flow, first into the heart center, then into the solar plexus. It is a precursor to the sound of the harp what the harp is going to do. The sound of the harp is a very special sound, a very surreal astral sound. It makes us feel a silent water flow of emotions downwards. And it brings us into a state where emotions well up. There are tears of intense feelings, which is with a strange combination of positive and painful feelings and more positive feelings. In the Indian context, spiritual context, there is a concept of Mahabhava. This Mahabhava, Mahabhava, Bhava as it's pronounced in English, Mahabhava to be more accurate. This Mahabhava is a state where tears overflow without any stimulus from outside nor there is active any ordinary memory inside. It's a spiritual event 
and often accompanied by overflow of tears. It's very cathartic, very purifying. You feel very light and relieved after it. But it's a very purifying spiritual event. And something near to that, the sound of the heart creates. It's a strong and silent water flow of emotions downwards, first felt in the heart center, then in the solar plexus. And one is almost on the verge of a Mahabhav, a verge of welling up of tears in the eyes. And it is undescribable, very difficult to articulate that state in words. The orchestra does in a mild way what the sound of the harp is really going to do in a strong way. The flute then comes in, that is the high point of the composition. And the feeling the flute releases in us is very different from any ordinary feelings we experience, which is what makes this composition so special in the history of music. To use Yerbindo's language, the sound of the flute is stationed at an overhead plane. It's above the normal state of the mind. And it's anchored there, stationed there, and it admits of influences from planes below. But primarily it's stationed in a very high plane above the ordinary mind. And there is a joy in that plane, but it's a serene joy. It is not a sensual joy. It is not a achievement joy. It is not an emotional joy. It is not even a knowledge joy. It's a higher joy, a serene joy above these ordinary joys. And it's a strange kind of enjoyment because this is not the enjoyment we usually experience and therefore we find it strange. And it creates a very deep longing, a very unfulfillable longing to use words from the film Amendus. It is really a longing, a very unfulfillable longing and it is a uh, a look of wonder from below to those heights. It is followed by the flute taking a slightly different form of melody and that releases a silent scream of ecstasy inside. And then the flute goes into playfulness and the playfulness, which is essentially a psychic characteristic, some part of it is admitted at the heights. Mother used to say that Indian music is special because it has a very distinct and strong psychic influence. We see here a small amount of psychic influence getting associated in that playful playing of the flute. Even as the flute is stationed above the ordinary planes, After the playful part of the composition, the composition goes on a slightly lower level in terms of the zones of consciousness. And then it again rises 
with a devotional joyful seeking and it releases a sweet pain of seeking and separation which is joyful both from eros standpoint and from a completely sublimated thanatos standpoint and with that the small part of composition i selected ends we see how different emotions different states are created and how conceptual clarity and capacity can be developed by using this interpretation of non verbal music the easier way is to just talk about zones inspiration from which zone the music is inspired which zone it has touched how it has lost a particular level and come down to another level or we can just talk about the build up of tension and the release of tension into pleasure so this is a very simple way to do it some day we do a comprehensive analysis of this composition we take this part also another simple way to do it would be to psychoanalyze mozart or pandit kumar gandharv and talk about the roots of this music in the musician but i have avoided that simple temptation to analyze psychoanalyze mozart and then in the context of that psychoanalyze this composition similarly psychoanalyze pandit kumar gandharv and in that context psychoanalyze this composition uh, more difficult challenging and more profitable is to treat their compositions as independent entities and psychoanalyze it coming to kumar gandharva pandit kumar gandharva lit pandit kumar gandharva's composition the sound expresses a state sound also expresses a story sound also expresses a phenomena and it's the theater of the sound in which pandit kumar gandharva is playing out this composition he starts the composition with dhasa and the first sound dha releases in us the understanding of heaviness of the earth element the inertia the center of inertia in us the sa is the jaw there is a sound of joy a ray of light and joy ray sound releases in us the understanding of being a sound of oscillating melody ga the sound releases in us the understanding of the central earth element in us the solar plexus neither it goes into the nether world of depression nor the happy worlds happy heavens above it is the central earth element it is the earth element of the muladhar which is experienced through the solar plexus or rather associated in a highly sublimated way with the solar plexus or oh, the sound is almost of a festering pus in the wood an old wood
the composition starts with the sound of joy the sorry the composition starts with the heaviness dhasa it starts with the heaviness of the inertia the earth center the dark center of pain bottled up pain inertia and aggression and in that state of heaviness gloom and depression that state of being captured by the earth center in a pathological way there is a healing movement there and there is a ray of light and joy which escapes from the heavy state of gloom aggression and depression and inertia and that sound escapes from there but soon the inertia the heaviness the gloom the aggression the pain they start to catch up couple with overwhelm and finally submerge that feeling of light and joy and bring it back into the heavy pathological center it's like light trying to escape a black hole and failing coming back to the black hole so initially there is a release of light and joy sare and then the other difficult feelings catch up with it and then the tone in the tone we see the sare gets loaded so much with aggression <clears throat> pain complaint of pain the wound of a child that the real flavor is overshadowed by this loading and then the positive part is to be completely submerged when aggression comes in in a positive way and instead of everything being captured into that center of pathological center of heaviness gloom and darkness and inertia although sa and ray are not able to escape it but in an aggressive way with aggression some joy is maintained protected with aggression there is a release a possibility of escaping that center the energy is generated and the positive aggression and the service of health is activated which keeps up the ego distinct from being submerged and one being capable of expressing and through that expression trying to heal the pathological center where everything is accumulated the story of the short song then is the ray of joy and light activated in the middle of the center of pathological center of gloom inertia pain and aggression that activated ray of joy and light is trying to escape the unconscious is loaded with pain aggression wound of a child it's festering long festering has created the pus in the wound of the child which comes up through the sound path this escaping ray of light and joy is neutralized by the pathological gravity of the unconscious the healing celebration change movement fails is drowned in pain but that aggression comes up positively and helps from a complete submergence and it escapes the great pathological gravity of the unconscious through an aggressive expression a complaint a scream against the pain which is inside inertia and gloom which is inside darkness which is inside the weeping of the wounded child in the unconscious finally finds its scream attenuated scream sublimated scream yet a scream all the same 
So we find this in that very short composition by Kumar Gandharva. We can see a very distinct influence of ordinary feelings, everyday feelings, and the touch of the psyche in a small amount. And a very small touch of joy of the above the mind planes when the composition touches it on some occasions. And therefore, it's very different from the composition of Mozart, which is essentially anchored largely above the mind. This has a strong psychic touch. Mozart has much lesser psychic touch. This is more of a healing composition. Mozart's is more of a celebrating composition. Both are extremely good compositions. Comparatively speaking, Mozart's composition is anchored at much higher heights. The volume of emotion is far higher in composition by Kumar Gandharva. We will stop today with capacity building in this area. Slowly we will get into the phenomena. Which psychoanalytic phenomena? Is it split or the Oedipus or the self-cohesion? Or release of an archetype, what kind of phenomena we see activated in us or what understanding is released in us in response to this non-verbal stimulus? Slowly we will develop this area. It is a new area. There would be substantial exploration yet to go on my part, on part of audience, on part of holistic healers and therapists who would like to develop this area and deploy this area for healing. Any questions, write to me at hvindia at gmail.com. Thank you.